condition of a Celtic state of mind. This is the Axon Bulletin. Uh, we've got an advert down down below by John Hughes for the uh, Bumblebee mug, all branded up, John. Well done. And uh, we've got Paddy McGill sitting there in a Borussia Dortmund top. What are you playing it, Paddy? Where's your Axon jersey, mate? Where's your trackie, your zipper, your T-shirt, your sun hat? I'm off uh, brand, anyway. Off you're brand. off brand, man. You're off brand. Get back on the narrative. How's everybody doing? Let's get some thoughts straight off the bat before we get stuck into the the meat and drink of Celtic in the last 24 hours. We've got half man, half pie. He's up there. We're having the best avatar and name on a Celtic State of Minds YouTube channel. Hail, hail to you. We've got Ian Roy coming in uh, from Florida, I believe. Hail, hail from Who's the Snitch? Afternoon all from Paddy. Jungle Lion in there, he's there and he's always there and he's saying strong six league, six league games come on away is awkward. I was asked about this, Patrick. We'll get back to the game. You guys haven't had a chance to talk about it on here, but um, looking at the running, the fact that we've got Rangers at home, the fact that we've got only two away games, these are big, big margins really, aren't they, in, in the title race? Oh yeah, and obviously the, the title rivals have got five away games and only two at home, so despite being, you know, if they win their game in hand two ahead, I, I think the, the advantage is with Celtic, uh, personally, after the result at the weekend. Um, I think the home games are going to be Hearts, Rangers and probably Hibs if they make the top six. Uh, so, you know, difficult games as it is uh, post-split, but um, the way that we're playing, the way we have been playing for about a month and a half, two months now, I think you've got to fancy us. I think you've got to take confidence from the weekend. Take confidence from the fact that guys like Hatati are back, Carter Vickers are back, um, you know, we're getting goals from different parts of the pitch. Um, and, you know, going into that split, obviously, as Jungle Line pointed out, Kelly away, that's arguably the toughest game of the six, you know, or your bogey team this season, or one of two with Hearts as well. Uh, plastic pitch, rugby park, pressure's on, but I, I, I do fancy us to go on and uh, seal the title now. You know, we've got the momentum behind us, in my opinion. Can Cole Marnick really get a fourth result against us in one season? I really hope not. Um, but he's right to point out that is, I think that's a game everyone's trading at the moment. Um, but, you know, I, I'm confident and I like to think the fan base are quite confident now. I hope so, Patrick. I mean, Scottish football and football surfaces, John, seem to go hand in hand. We're talking about the plastic pitch, obviously. There's a game on, or maybe not tonight, where Rangers might be up to their knees in Dundee mud if the game goes ahead. John, <laughs> how confident are you in the running? <laughs> well, wouldn't it be funny if that's what it did for them? Uh, make a wee song about that. I can't imagine what tune we would use. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I was after the game, I was... Despite the fact I thought going into it, we needed to win. Uh, I was incredibly anxious, thought we needed to win this game um, because, you know, to give us that wee bit of uh, a, an edge, uh, there's a strong possibility it might not even be the Rangers game that decides us uh, the way the teams have been playing all year. Now, in saying that, I'm confident that we are now good enough. Uh, we're not going to slip up in those lesser games. I think we're playing well enough now that that's not going to happen. Um, but the reality is they only have to get a draw. And depending on how they set up, I mean, we've seen them do it in Europe. Uh, they set up a different way in Europe. I don't know why they set up the way they do against us, but they set up a different way in Europe. And if they set up that way, you know, it gives them a decent chance of getting a draw. So, um yeah, the ball is definitely still in their court. Uh, now we have to we have to win. We have to win at home. Uh, that's not beyond the realms of possibility by any means. In fact, I strongly think that suspect that we're going to do that. But you know, yeah, if, if you are looking at it objectively, which is what the bookies do, and the bookies have Rangers as favourites, so you know, you know, if they win this game tonight, they're back to two points in front. Um, but any slip from them. Uh, you know, I think that's it done because uh, I think when we need to beat them, we do beat them. Uh, their only results against us are you know, gen you know, what draws basically. I think we've won what six, but the last nine drawn the other couple. 
can't remember, I can't even remember the last time they beat us. Um, so, you know, I think we're... The bookies may think the odds are in Rangers' favour. Uh, I may still be concerned, but, you know, the reason I'm not panicking about it is because overall, uh, I think things are turning for us at the right time. I think people are coming back at the right time. Uh, I think they'll be coming on to a game at the right time. And I think we're going to have a very strong finish, as one of the uh, commenters just said, contributors just said. So, I, I um, yeah, I mean, after it, I was pretty sanguine. I was really, really disappointed. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought it was safe to go for a P after after Ida scored. Um, and, I, and I left, it was massive rock of cel- the rock of celebrations. And when I came back in, it was like a graveyard. Uh, so it, that was, it was sort of pretty confusing. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was you know, I, I can't believe we didn't see the game out, to be honest with you. But there's frustrations. But overall, I still think we can get it done. And I'm still confident we will. Yeah, this is a big thing. <clears throat> there are frustrations, John, because... Once we get past speaking about refereeing decisions, um, et cetera, we then can focus on what we did wrong, what we could have done much, much better. And and obviously, to try and be as balanced as possible, you've got to look inward and you've got to say, well, you know, that that um, the fact that our, our slack passing was actually a feature of the second half, not just, um, you know, in the moves that led to the two goals for Rangers, is something we really need to sort out. We need to look at the fact um, that all season we've had issues with the the wingers, we start to get them up to speed and then we don't have the same threat down the right-hand side. Why is that? Is that just big match nerves, do you think, Patrick? Because I think at certain points this season, we've seen some good form from Palmer, Yang and Kuhn. But it's all about trying to get that consistency. I mean, I, I felt that Kuhn, I felt a wee bit sorry for him because of the booking, to be fair. And I felt that, you know, he couldn't play his normal game, even though he's on the wing. A big part of that is obviously defending, which we've seen later on when Yang failed to do so, and they got they got their goal. Um, but I'm a wee bit frustrated in the fact that when I'm looking at the strongest lineup, that's the position I'm not sure about. To this day, I'm still not sure who is our best right winger. It's a bit frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think we're all sort of chomping at the bit for Abada to come back in, in late December. And we all thought, you know, despite what's going on, he got a great reception. He was backed by the fans and he scored plenty of goals, especially in big games for Ange, and it obviously didn't work out, he had to leave, as what it is, but you're now left with that position, and it appears to be Coons for the next seven or eight games, depending if we make the cup final, um, because as much as Yang, I think it was Dundee, the 7-1 game, it, it looked quite good, and then he gets that red card at Harps, and I don't think he's started a game since, but for me, I didn't. I didn't think he was that consistent when he played before Christmas. I thought he was very poor against uh, Kelly in the one-one draw at Parkhead. I think that was the middle of February. Um, had a, a decent you know, game or two, and then he's made a, another mistake for me. And as much as he is only, I think he's only twenty or twenty-one. Clearly, clearly fast, but I think his decision making is very poor. Um, I think he can be quite rash at times, and he's over. He's arguably cost his. Uh, you know, the third goal that we conceded in that 92nd minute. Um, so it's it's definitely off for grabs next season, but it certainly seems to be Coons for um, the next six, seven, maybe eight games. And, you know, he done well. You know, first half, we defended resolutely. Um, he got a few decent balls into the box. I think it was his cross that won us the penalty um, for the, our second goal. Um, so I, I didn't think he'd done that badly. Obviously, you need to do the dirty side, defend and... Uh, Maeda does that so well against Tavernier mm-hmm. and couldn't done a, a decent enough job at the weekend, but it is obviously a problem position. And it's quite interesting that Palmer, who I, I believe was fit, but wasn't in the squad at all, even though he was, you know, one of the first names in the team sheet um, before Christmas, he seems to have totally fallen out of favour. So I, I personally think both positions are up for grabs in the summer. I think that's one of the first places we need to strengthen after the goalkeeper. Um, and, you know, as I say, Yang arguably cost us with that third goal at the weekend. Yeah. Just in de- defence of Yang, um, I-, I went back to look at it. And even this morning, I spent like a solid, you know, 
five, six minutes just watching the same bit again and again. Alistair Johnson lets the ball run under his foot initially from the ball from Dessers. He lets it run under his foot into the box. Then Alistair Johnson drops back behind Yang. He doesn't support him. He drops back and he's marking nobody. He's, he's marking space. So he's five to six yards uh, behind uh, Yang, inside of him, marking nobody. So I don't know, perhaps he was waiting for Yang to show him to the outside and waiting for the cutback. Uh, so perhaps from his point of view, uh, it was an intelligent bit of play. But as it turned out, I mean, obviously Yang had turned out inside out. He was just, he, he was left on his wrong foot. And that was, this level, unacceptable, you know, for, for you know, for, for someone like me who's just like in business and stuff, it's the same thing as when you go into a meeting, you need to know what outcome you want from that meeting. Uh, and if that, you don't get that outcome, you need to know what, you know, the next best thing is, what you're prepared to accept. And it's the same in positions like that. You need to know that your best option, your outcome is to show him down the outside. You need to know that, uh, you know, the best option is show him down the outside and get the tackle in. And if that's not the best option, it's shown down the outside, he gets the ball in and that ball's defended by the likes of Alistair Johnson, who's just standing in space. Um, but you can't you, you can't get caught so badly on the wrong foot as that. So, yes, I mean, Yang did very poorly, but I would question uh, absolutely what Alistair Johnson was doing. Do you think he's been getting a bit of an easy ride of it when it comes down to it, Paddy? I don't remember him getting much of a stick on here yet. You know, when you look at some of the performances this season, they've not really been up to the same kind of standard that we got used to last season from Johnson. Um, I know he's had a couple of wee injuries this season, but, you know, with regards to the penalty decision, we'll come to that because, you know, there's there's been various different takes on it. I took a wander in paradise with Tino from the Celtic Exchange and his take on it was in the rules of the game that the penalty can be given. If that's the case... I'm watching that now thinking it myself. And, and correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, because my view on this, and I know I'm biased. This is the thing. I'm consciously biased. And that's why I'm asking for you to tell me what part of this I can't see. I felt Silva dived, and that's the first, that is the first offence. You've dived. Only after he's dived has there been any connection. And the connection of, of Johnson's boot on his kind of knee area only came after Johnson had made obviously contact and won the ball. And it was this kind of flailing foot. Football isn't a non-contact sport, Patrick. I mean, which part of that do you think I'm getting wrong or do you do you agree with me? No, I agree. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I agree with your opinion, but it's also possible that Tino is right, that it is within the rules of the game because it's just the way the game's going. I mean, I, I, it, it would appear that um, every form of contact in the 18-yard box is now a penalty. Because, you know, for me, Johnson gets the ball, he's going to ground, he's, he's fallen down and Silva is almost sort of running into his foot and then goes down because of that contact, which is, I mean, it's ridiculous. That minimal amount of contact will not cause someone to go down. He's, it's obviously simulation um, and I, I don't think the booking's out of order in the first instance for diving. Um, so I, I agree, it's not a penalty. Um you know, there's arguments that our penalty was soft. It, it sort of comes off Maeda's head just before it hits Goldson's arm. I don't think the direction of the ball changes all too much between Maeda's head and Goldson's elbow, arm, whatever it hits. Not only that, if it doesn't hit his elbow, I think it's going straight on Scales' head and arguably going in the back of the net. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I don't really buy into this. I'm meeting people halfway that they were both soft. I think... Theirs was not a penalty, and ours definitely was. Um, and, you know, maybe the way football's going, maybe they're both penalties because all contact is now a penalty in the 18 yard box. But, um, you know, there, Declan just pointed out Saka last night. There is contact, but he's quite clearly looking for it. In my opinion, he, he outstretches his leg, and the referee very bravely decided not to give it, which I think is the correct decision. Um, because I just don't think all contact in the box is a penalty. But unfortunately, it's the way football's going. You know, if uh, it was, John, if it was the way it was going, yeah. just be consistent with it. Because last week, Kyogo, you know, <clears throat> was in a situation where we didn't get it. We, we just can't have it, though. 
we can't have it. We can't have it being like that because it just means every single time there's any form of contact in the box, it's, guys, guys, it'll be like it's something out of one of these epics for the Lord strikes down a whole host of people. There'll be guys dropping in the box right, left and centre, just touched by nothing, all holding their faces and rolling about. You know, we just can't have it. It's not right. Yeah. It's going to completely ruin the game. I saw that sack. I went, it was a blatant dive. Nonsense. Um, and as for Silva, the, the love child of Terry Hurlock and Tom Daly, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know yeah, what a disgraceful performance that was. Absolutely disgraceful. Disgraceful to the point where Beaton, quite rightly, thought, oh, no, you, you can't do this again. You know, and um, but even, even Alistair Johnson's booking, he slightly obstructed the boy. Um, and, uh, you know, Silva's gone down like a ton of bricks, like he's been shot in the face by a sniper. Um, so, you know, that's why he ends up getting the booking. Uh, and then we end up, for instance, getting Matt O'Reilly booked for like almost no contact at all on uh, Matondo or Seema or whoever it was, can't remember. Um, but, you know, and, and we cannot have that in the box. It, it was it was never a penalty, not in a million years. Um, uh, Beaton was right the first time. There are serious, serious questions, obviously, now about what VAR showed. Now, I was screaming at the, the, the TV at the time, show them the other angle show them the other angle. Because not only did I think that they weren't showing um, the, the angle where uh, Alistair Johnson touched the ball, the only angle they appeared to be shown, the only picture they appeared to be shown is the contact. That was it. Completely out of context. You know, and that was at the time it was happening. So Celtic are absolutely right that there are serious questions about uh, VAR. John Beaton has made the correct decision. He's gone over there and he's been talked out of the correct decision. Mm -hmm. Right, and the only thing it ended up the only way I thought we were fortunate after that was I thought as soon as he gave that penalty he was going to book Alistair Johnson and send him off so I was grateful that that didn't happen um, so you know, it was never a penalty and I don't know what this uh, I, maybe I missed that when you were saying uh, they were both soft are you talking about the Goldson penalty the, the, the one that Goldson gave Patrick was that you? Yeah. I mean, not soft, but there's an argument to be made that because there's such a short distance, it comes off Maida's head that there's nothing Goldson can do about it. But in my opinion, that's not true because his arm is outstretched like this, and it's, it's denying Scales a chance to head of it goal. Imagine, imagine he was facing the other way and jumping for the ball. Wow! <laughs> right. and, it, know, and it collided uh, with his own player midair. Imagine uh, that. Do you know? Imagine that was knocked out the way. You know, I, it's, it's, that is the stonewall of handball as we've seen all season. You know, because there are genuine, genuine questions around a whole load of these, as we know, especially ones given against us. That's the stone wall, as we've seen. The only thing we've given it's goals, and I'm just surprised he didn't do a full-on dive and try and stick his gloves back in his pocket afterwards. Yeah, you know, so uh, no, that's the stone wall, as we've seen. It was definitely 100% a penalty. Ours never was. Beaton got it right. VAR got it wrong. And there are serious questions about that. And the fact... Very interestingly, the fact that Celtic have now, you know, sent up a missive, apparently. When was the last time that happened? Ever. When was the last time Celtic, you know, did, did the Rangers and questioned something that happened during the game? Mm -hmm. So to me, that suggests that all the evidence now that's been accumulating uh, <clears throat> and has been brought to us by, well, I think uh, the, the word was uh, Desmond had his own people looking into it in order to make up a strong case. Um, but I suspect a lot of that might, might have come from from Alan Morrison, uh, and I, you know I think now that the, the club have pointed out to them in black and white they are accountants and lawyers after all. If they pointed out to them in black and white, these are the facts. This is not subjective. These are the facts. Um, this is what is happening. So now the, the club are less likely to dismiss us and dismiss the rest of the fans as saying. Well, you're all paranoid, you know, the, you know, we don't want to get involved in that. And instead, you know, they've immediately stepped forward and said, what happened there? What, in what context can the fact that he won the ball not be included? You know, what are you trying to do there? What are you trying to show him? Because like, if you look at, because um, this has gone the wrong way. I thought it would go the way of rugby, which would be difficult enough in football. But it's gone the wrong way. The rugby will have it much better than this. Because what the VAR does in the rugby is basically you show them, you say to the referee, 
uh, I want to show you something here that there might have been contact. And then you shut up. And then, you know, and that's why I think they would shut up if they knew these the, the, the communications were being recorded. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, if, if you're sitting there, I think there may have been contact. And then you close your mouth. You're not trying to prosecute a case. You're not trying to make a case. All you're saying is, here's the incident. And the ref will go, show me another angle, show me another angle, and then he'll make up his mind. It's not up to you. It's not up to you. It's not up to the bar. You're not refereeing the game. So it's up to the referee to make the decision. And that's not what's happening. It's clearly not what's happening. You're not telling me that Beaton watched that the first time, then changed his mind the second time, based purely on that. He is being pushed to do that by VAR. He's being influenced. And what annoys me and concerns me even further, John, is that when the SFA review the, the use of and the success of VAR, they come back and tell you it's like 96% feel safe and you think that's just an absolute nonsense. Thanks everybody for getting involved in the chat and the comments. We're going to be bringing you up as often as possible throughout the show. You are watching, of course, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitch, uh, YouTube, and um, very soon you'll be watching on Instagram Live as well. Big Thumbs up from Jim Crockwell on the Facebook. Uh, great to hear from you, Jim. I hope you're doing well. We're getting a bit of love from George Munro and Lloyd Patrick Jepson. That's a familiar name. But Eddie Barr is angry. Eddie, why are you angry on the Facebook? Let us know. What is angering you on the Facebook channel? Smell the glove brings it up. Blame John for going for a pee. Three, two. I often wonder, John, we've all, we've all missed very important um, incidents and happenings uh, because of the force of nature. I wonder if anybody was at Lisbon, they just couldn't hold on any longer and they missed the winning goal. They would never admit it, Patrick. They would never admit it. Um, Tony Cassidy, I'm going to bring up your comment here because it has to be discussed. Um, Tony, how much are we paying towards the child abuse case? Any idea? There has obviously been an update over the last 48 hours of sorts we were aware of the class uh, action that had been uh, taking place for over 20 um, ex-players of the Celtic Boys Club um, and obviously there's been a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that we're not aware of but solicitors uh, representing the 20 odd former players um, are saying that a significant progress has been made towards Celtic settling the legal case and it could run into millions I'm guessing John it will be millions in terms of each player um, so it's one of these things that, you know, I personally became aware of it back in the 90s, wasn't it? When Fergus first took over and Alan Brazil um, raised his complaint, John, and that's where it started in earnest. And since then, it has come back and there has been guys like Jim Torbett, Frank Kearney jailed for these offences uh, and others. And hopefully justice, if there is such a thing for anybody who has been affected by this, will be served and soon i think it, it will be happening in the next few months john yeah um yeah, it's just it's a, it's a horrific situation to be honest um this is something that affected me uh in my school life uh, my my school was a, a nest of pedophiles as it turned out uh, fortunately i escaped that but say uh, other people were not so fortunate guys who are still suffering serious trauma um, today, uh, the millions will not be millions for each player, not a chance. The millions will be a sum total of, because unless you can prove damages to, you know, you're not getting multi-million pound judgments and stuff like this um, against, you know, for an individual. Uh, so it's unlikely. Um, it's also not Celtic that will be paying it as the insurers. Uh, otherwise, it would have had to be a contingent liability uh, in the accounts for the last number of seasons. Um, and I was told it was the insurers uh, all the way along. Uh, so that aside, uh, the reason why people on the dark side are raging is because it is not um, it is not the financial death blow they thought it might be, which is why they've uh, been promoting this. They're not remotely interested in victims of uh, abuse, not remotely interested in victims of abuse. Uh, otherwise, why are they only interested in the victims of you know abuse that happened at Celtic or Celtic's feeder club? Um, so it's just about trying to uh, get one over on us um, for, for them. But from our point of view, uh, if these things have happened, they need to be addressed. Uh, it needs to be dealt with um, and justice needs to be done. 
because uh, the, the, you know there are some things in life that are far more important than football, and certainly you know what team you support. Um, there are uh, this was still going on. You know, I, I can remember when my, my brother played for uh, the, the boys' club. Uh, there was guys hanging about there um, at that time who subsequently had been prosecuted, uh, who were, uh, you know, up to no good. Um, but the other thing people have to remember is, because I, I do remember it, because I, I was going through it with people in my vicinity, nobody knew what this was at the time. We just thought they were sort of old and gay, and that's when we put no offence to anyone who is, but that's just... We, you know, we, we didn't have a word for it. Um, so no one had heard the paedophile until about 15 years later. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, uh, that's how they got away with it. Then they got away with it, you know, for a long time and lots of different clubs because nobody was really sure what it was. Nobody was, you know, because the internet didn't exist. You didn't know what was going on all over the place or that there was loads of these guys uh, and that this was a real issue. You just thought that was, that guy was dead bookie and dodgy and keep away from them and, you know, all the rest of this stuff. We were all very naive, to be fair. Um, so, you know, it was different times, very different times. People people forget that. Uh, and these guys were very, very good at building relationships, mm -hmm. uh, building relationships with people in power, building relationships with parents, building relationships uh, with, with people of influence in order uh, that they could get away with doing what they needed to do. They're brilliant at manipulating. They're evil people who are great at manipulating. You know, as I say, like the whole situation is tragic. I could go on uh, for a long time about it. As I say, unfortunately, I know lots and lots of people who have been affected directly. It was going on right under my nose, and there was a massive investigation into my school, uh, which led to the Scottish uh, Child Sex Abuse Tribunals and all sorts of stuff going on. So, um, you know, it, it is a horrific, horrific situation. I, I think the club need to get this set up. But, I, you know, as far as I understand it, the club have basically no say in this. Uh, you know, if the club release statements which accepts liability or anything like that, the, the insurers will cut them loose and then the club will be liable. So that's why I'm led to believe it's taken so long and why negotiations have been so protracted. So this is all down to, you know, if I'm what, what I'm led to believe is correct. It's basically all down to the insurers. Yeah, I mean, John, honestly, what you've just told us there really, you know, it brings it home how close it can be. I mean, Patrick, when you think about uh, the manipulative nature of these predators and the fact that, you know, anyone who played football at boys club level, for example, would be getting taken on tours and trips. And, you know, we were always going to Amsterdam. You're at the mercy of, of adults that you trust. And there's also, you imagine um, the feeling of this dream of playing for Celtic. And that being used against you. If you tell anybody you're never playing for Celtic, it's horrific to try and understand the inner workings of these sinister minds, Patrick. But with these updates, I think what we're, we're coming to, and I use words like resolution and I use words like justice, the, the, the victims won't feel that there's ever a resolution or there's ever going to be justice. But there needs to be something whereby they... Um, are it's something where they're saying, right? You know what? You were, you were abused. We're going to, we're going to take that on board. We're going to admit that, and this is what's going to happen. And I think what what's happened um, over the last few months with the the class action is that it seems as though it will come to this natural conclusion. And at that point, I don't know what the the statement will be. As John says, the club will be advised accordingly, and all this kind of stuff. But it isn't something we can ignore, is it? No, definitely not. Um, as you say, it's obviously something that's sort of it's it's been public knowledge since I think was it ninety five or something. Alan Brazil came out and said so almost thirty years, and hopefully it'll be coming to a conclusion soon for the sake of you know just about everyone. Um, I mean, I'm not terribly up to date with you know every single detail. I believe all the abusers are either dead or in jail. Um, I'm not entirely sure on that. Maybe someone can correct me. Um, you know, when it comes to compensation, hopefully that can obviously um, be be coming to a conclusion soon as well. Because, as you say, there isn't really any justice for this. I mean, some of these people have been walking free for what fifty plus years uh, with no punishment. Now, guys in their eighties now have been sent to jail, and you know, probably will spend a lot of time in there. Um, so, 
it's not really justice in that sense. Obviously, there's financial compensation, and that can. I don't even know if it, the word is comfort or closure, or you know, but it's it's hopefully going to come to a conclusion, and the guilty parties can be identified, and those alive will be in jail, and it's obviously something the club have had to deal with and it's as as John said you know there wasn't there wasn't a word for it back then there wasn't the internet there weren't phones or CCTV so it was and as you say with the um, the pressures of playing for Celtic the, the sort of I mean the, the the victims must have felt a terrible sense of being trapped you know the, the people in Glasgow and Celtic fans and you know the levels of poverty you know back in the day it would have been such a massive pressure but also a dream to play for Celtic and when you don't really know what to call that and what you might be labelled as John said you know sort of old gay men there wasn't really this this knowledge of paedophilia back then it must have been such a terrifying experience and as you say there isn't really any comfort or closure when it comes to this but um, certainly as I say you know the perpetrators have been identified have been punished where they can be and they can at least have some sort of financial compensation for what they've had to go through um, because it is, it's horrific and it was obviously quite prevalent in society at that time. John's mentioned his school. You've obviously got famously lots of characters in movie, showbiz, um, people like Savile and stuff like that. So it was certainly a problem in society back then. Who knows if it still is now, but obviously these people need to be identified and exposed and punished and you know, hopefully there can be some sort of closure for everyone involved um, uh, when this eventually reaches a conclusion. I just say there, I can see people in the comments saying, oh, will compensation make a difference? No, what compensation does is it puts a full stop on it and as much as something happened to me and I was compensated for that, mm -hmm. I'm not just howling at the moon, I'm not just making this up, I'm not just randomly saying this and was unable to prove it. This is a thing that happened, and as a result, I was compensated for it. Um, and there's a guy, you know, again, one of the victims was close, um, I know, um, and he is still, you know, he just what happened to him was absolutely horrific. Um, and this was at my school. And uh, But all the guys, as you said earlier on, Patrick, most of these offenders are dead, gone. You know, all the rest of it uh, are, are too old to be deported from Australia or wherever they are now. Uh, and so they're just getting away with it. So the only way you can put a full stop on it is say, this happened to me. But just, I want the world to bear witness to the fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, so, John. Absolutely. And the big thing for me is we will never um, avoid the subject. It's something that needs to be discussed. And it's something that needs to be discussed so that, you know, there's generations of people now who are well aware of what can go on so that they can be more protected to it as well. Anyone who engages in this kind of point scoring on the socials gets an immediate block from me uh, because the way their minds are working is just warped. They've obviously never been exposed to something like this uh, or know anyone who's been exposed to something like this because you just wouldn't use it and weaponize it. Um, so yes, that that is a good point. Tony, thanks for bringing it up and we will continually discuss that until this closure, as we're calling it just now, uh, comes to fruition. Now, on the Facebook, we have various people making comments. We can't see your glorious avatars until you register on the Facebook. There's a small process, but you're saying that Rangers went into the game wanting all three points, then celebrate a draw. They are looking past the games they have to play before they come to Celtic Park. What do you make of that? Sorry, did John. they not win? Did they not win? It was a three each victory. Yes. So, so, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm sorry, saying. Paul, get it right, Paul moral, John, so. moral victory. You know. um, when you look afterwards at the momentum and the momentum swing of a win, Patrick, it would have been absolutely massive in this title race. It was a draw. I've come away from that thinking, right, if someone says it was going to be two each or three each, would I be happy with it? I'd have been much happier with a win, but... I would come away from that thinking, all right, it's not as though it's derailed us. To get the draw and behave like that, does that show a mentality, like almost a loser's mentality? Do they have, do, does your challengers have what it takes to go to the end of the, the line with this, this title fight? Because if that was me, I'm looking at it going, that's a wee bit defeatist, you know, celebrating a draw like that, particularly when the same fans were booing them off the park at half time. 
Yeah, um, I think it does. And I think it shows a psychological edge that we've had in this fixture for, you know, you're talking maybe 12, 13 years, um, certainly since he came back into the division in 2016. Um, you know, obviously Brendan laid down that marker uh, with the 5 1 in September 2016. They had a wee mini resurgence when, you know, football was uh, played behind closed doors and you had, you know, Leicester beating Man City 5 2 at the Etihad. And, you know, the, the world just went a bit nuts for 12 months. But ever since fans have been back into the ground, you know, I think. I think Ange lost his first game and then last May when the league was already won, they beat us again and that was a sort of another moral victory. But realistically, they've not beaten us in a meaningful game in almost three years now. Um, and I, I think it, just, it, it does show a psychological edge and it'll be interesting to see how this run-in affects them because they might have the game in hand, but the, the points are very close and they're not used to winning. Um, we are now in a bit of a groove, a bit of momentum. Um, and I, I really do fancy to to win these six games. And as you say, um, you'd have preferred the win, and the win would have swung it. You know, I think if they won, it would have been 95% certain they'd win the league. If we won it, it would have been about 85 90% certain we'd have won the league. Um, so a draw, you know, I, I said on here for a few weeks, I'd always take a draw at Ibrox. Disappointing in the manner in which we got the draw, but take the result anyway. Um, and... I, I certainly wouldn't have been. I, I wasn't celebrating a draw, and you know, Rangers fans that I know personally, also in the cold light of day, also are now not celebrating a draw, and um, because they realise that we've got the easier games on paper, we've got the home game uh, against them. So, I, I, that's why I think we've got the momentum, we've got the advantage, and uh, I, I think there's definitely a psychological edge uh, between the two teams, and luckily it's in our favour. I want to talk a wee bit, John, because um, we, we do every pre-season um, talk about aspirations as a Celtic supporter, talk about European progress. And here we are in a dogfight um, to win the league with a team who you're, you're thinking, well, we, we should be miles ahead of them. You know, we've just won a double and a treble. What on earth has gone on here? But it doesn't enter our minds after a while. We're a fickle bunch of football fans, aren't we? And we're now just talking about winning this league and, and staying a a whisker ahead of the opposition. And that's exactly what we criticise the board for, John. But it's difficult not to look at it in any other way when you're putting this scenario, isn't it? Uh, well, no, the only reason I'm not constantly raging about the, the outrageously unacceptable situation that we're in is because there's no point at the moment. You can't do anything about it. So uh, it, it's completely pointless. The, the windows are gone. Uh, we, you know, We're in this situation. There is no point screaming and hollering when nothing can be done. Now, that said, they could be sacking people mm -hmm. uh, or moving people around or getting people into position or doing something with the football department uh, in expectation of next year. But I suspect they are going to want to see if we win this and Brendan Rodgers stays before they start piling a load of money uh, into anything. You know, and as to, you know, you talk about aspirations, you talk about expectations, because in terms of mentality, you know, this team, our team, the spine of that team, you know, is actually to the other day have been forged in the crucible of victory and they are held together by the fragile threads of expectation. And so when something goes wrong or the chips get down here, I fully expect them to crumble. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, if it comes down to mentality, if it comes down to grinding it out, I think we'll be in a good position. Now, we are not as capable of doing that as we were uh, and for all the reasons that uh, you, you point out that we can't rage about just now because there's nothing you can say about them. But trust me, I would love to. I would absolutely love to. As everyone on here knows, my favourite subject is, is recruitment and the board and I've not been talking about them for weeks now. It actually hurts. Right? It's just Because you can't do anything about it. And are they getting a free pass? Yes, they're getting a free pass. Uh, at, the, at the moment, you know, uh, so, but let's see what happens if we don't win this. In fact, let's see what happens if we do win this, because I don't think there's a fan, whether we win it or not, who would think that the way that we got over the line here, uh, although it will be dramatic, although it will be unbelievable, although it will be uproarious, you know, it will be fabulous, it is not the way anyone wanted to uh, or even dreamed of that we would get this close 
to this kind of a battle where we're potentially two points behind tonight, only a handful of games to go. That is not where any of us wanted to be. And it is, it's completely unacceptable that that's where we are. But it's where we are at the moment. We'll deal with the other bits at the, the, you know, the end of the season once we know where the, the land lies. Because there is a strong possibility that, you know, I, I think that, you know, if Brendan Rodgers loses in a two-horse race when we get 70 million in the bank, reputation, because that's what people will know. Mm-hmm. They'll not know that, oh, he was trying to finesse the board. You know, they'll not know, oh, he, you know, whether he did or didn't choose due diligence. The fact will be there was a £70 million war chest there, right? Uh, and uh, he lost a two-horse race to a club that's basically bankrupt uh, and is held together uh, on foundations of sand by generous benefactors uh, who are all owed, I don't know however many, tens of millions but they'll probably start paying a few of those loans back if they were to win this one. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's a situation where, you know, I don't know what Brendan does after this. I, I think he would have to stay just to redeem himself because if he walks away after one season and losing it in these circumstances, you know, I I, I, I don't see how he can go and get a job elsewhere, um, you know, because nobody's going to miss that. You know, it's got to... No, no, no one in our support has missed it. You know, so I think it's uh, right now. There's a lot of things up in the air. There's a lot of pressure on a lot of people, uh, including the fans, <laughs> and we're all trying to hold it together and just hope right. uh, we go over the line. <laughs> no, there there was a lot of pressure going into that game, and um, my throat is still suffering as a result of that, Patrick. What I find quite interesting now is that there's been a few games, a couple of games, where um, the four Japanese players, Iwata. Hatati, Kyogo and Maeda have all started. Now, this is not something that Ange Postacoglu, who brought them all to the club, was able to do. I mean, obviously, we signed six players from Japan. Best of knowledge to Ange, who you know, had a great insight into the Japanese game. A couple of them haven't worked out in um, Idiguchi and Kobayashi. But isn't it unusual that all this time later, we've now got four Japanese players um, who are holding down their jerseys. But the big question, of course, is what happens now, particularly in the midfield area, to someone like Awata. Awata was well involved in the game. I think I criticised him at half time because his ball retention wasn't good enough. He was taking too long, too laboured on the ball. He was losing it too often. Um, is he naturally the guy to drop out for McGregor coming back in, do you think? Yeah, I think he is. You know, I think our best midfield, I think we've known for just over two years now, it's going to be McGregor, Hatati, O'Reilly. It looks as if in the summer, you know, we're only going to get eight more games of that trio. Um, absolute maximum, unfortunately, as sad as it is. Um, but unfortunately for Awata, uh, that's just, it's just the way it is. You know, I think you've got to have Hatati in there. Absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. Um, you know, O'Reilly was phenomenal. Uh, in the first half of the season, he's got better in recent weeks, and you know it's coincided with their uptick in form. I don't think that's a coincidence, and you obviously need to start your captain. So I think that is a midfield three. I didn't think Awata was that good at the weekend. I like Awata. Uh, I think he's strong. I think he's quite quick. He's a bit slow in releasing the ball, uh, in mm. my opinion, uh, and he was caught out against uh, Hearts. I think. I think it was. Um, I think that goal was ruled out, ruled out right enough. But I didn't think he was that good. And I actually said to Declan on the 60th minute, I goes, I think we should bring McGregor on. I think it's a good time. Turns out it wasn't the best decision. McGregor wasn't fully fit. Um, you know, watching the, watching parts of the game back, I actually think I, I've had to done quite well in the first half. And when a defensive midfielder doesn't have much to do or isn't really involved in the game, that's maybe not a bad thing. Um, so on reflection, I think he played quite well. But Unfortunately for him, he's just not part of the best midfield three. He's obviously got a job to do. McGregor's still not fully fit. He can come on. Hatati probably isn't fully fit. He can come on for him as well. So he'll definitely get minutes probably in all eight games this season if we get to the final. Um, But I don't think he's in the starting 11 in that midfield three. What's your thoughts, John? I mean, I'm a big fan of Iwata. I really am. He's, He's finally got into the team. But I agree with Patrick, I think. Your strongest midfield is Hatati O'Reilly and McGregor. Well, it was a gamble bringing back Callum uh, in that game. It didn't pay off. Uh, so, you know, 
if you'd asked me, would I have made that substitution? 100% yes, because you're assuming if he's on the bench, he's going to be fit. And plus, you know, I would have had Kuno a lot earlier uh, because I was so worried about the rate we were getting booked at uh, that I just thought we can't afford to lose. You know, if we're going to lose uh, one of the, the central guys, we can't afford to lose someone in the wing, you know. So I, I would I wanted Jiang on earlier. Uh, so that, that's how much I know about substitutions. Because uh, <laughs> uh, he didn't exactly cover himself in glory, but I just didn't want him to get sent off, and it appeared as if he was heading that way. He was, the number of uh, made a number of rash tackles, but anyway, um, yeah, Callum looked to me as if uh, he needs to come on again, uh, in, you know, against uh, St. Mirren uh, and maybe play another half. I don't think he should be playing the full game. Uh, he didn't look as if he was close to being in that position. I think we threw him in there, hoping for the inspirational maestro, you know, dictating the play. Uh, and that's not what we got. And it's just another lesson. And, you know, you can't expect... You know, sometimes people do come back from injury and surprise you. I think Katati has been surprisingly good, given how long he was out for. Yeah. Uh, so that has been a surprise. So maybe the manager was influenced by that. Just thinking, I sure, you know... If he does what Hattati does, if he throw him back in, he'll be grand. Uh, but he wasn't grand. Uh, and that all coalesced into, uh, you know, again, I think it's the first time in, I've ever shouted at a television screen, composure, 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 you know, because we just appeared to be losing the plot. Uh, so, you know, those, those sort of mistakes... The, it's the kind of thing that your teammates look at and it just makes everyone that bit edgy. It just makes everyone that wee bit nervous because all of a sudden you've gone from a position of strength um, and now they're back in it and everyone's a wee bit edgy. Uh, and that's exactly what it looked like. And the guy who you would rely on to stop that edginess from pervading is Callum McGregor. You know, so that that's not helpful when he is uh, when he's uh, having a game like that. So... You know, it's. I don't think there's much doubt, but the best midfield is if everyone's fit. Uh, but you know, fitness to me is still an issue, maybe for the next one or two games. Yeah. No, I, I think that your point on McGregor, maybe just playing a part in the game against Simpson is a good one because he did. He seemed really off it, and I pointed out that the moment that it, it kind of dawned on me was he was chasing back and he looked pretty slow. You know, which isn't Callum McGregor. He looked as though he was carrying a wee bit. And um, yeah, another maybe 35 minutes against St. Min, and I'll be feeling a lot better about him. Right, I want to talk, Patrick, about Brendan Rodgers' naughty step because um, you mentioned earlier about Palmer um, being fit, no be, no featuring. We've seen Lagerbelk um, in a similar scenario this season. Noroski to a, a lesser degree. And Haksabanovic, um tweeting or posting all his way to Stoke uh, because that's what happens if you annoy Brendan Rodgers. Is is that where Palma is, do you think, Patrick? Do you think he's uh, suffered the same fate? I don't I think it's Stoke. possible. I don't mean Stoke, I mean the notice. The notice. <laughs> <laughs> Wait some for that fate come July, you never know. Um, I mean, I, I, I've got no, uh, any, I've not got any proof of this, but you know, I, I didn't really like Haksabanovic's uh, attitude. I thought you know, when guys are posting with gold grills in their teeth and they can't even get in the start of my living uh, in Scotland, I just think it's a bit embarrassing and it, it, it shows the wrong mentality. So I was quite happy to see Haksabanovic leave. Obviously, Bernabe, he's got his history. He's now out the door for a year. Um, Lagerbelk is a strange one. I mean, not the best passer of the ball. And, you know, people say he's slow. I don't think he's that slow. Um, uh, it's it's a real mystery why he can't seem to get in the eleven. I mean, he was all set to get on a flight and go out the door uh, back in January. We were keeping him because we had a bit of an injury crisis, and even with that injury crisis, I think at times we played a water at centre half. Um, and you know, Lagerbell because I don't think he's played a minute um, since uh, scoring the winner against Feyenoord. So uh, a lot of these, I think, you can put down to mentality. Um, but you know some of them are mysteries. Um, when it comes to Palmer, I mean, you know, mentioning Feyenoord, I, I can't remember us. I mean, he scored against Mother, goal against Mother, but he's not really contributed an awful lot since December. 
Um, that could be a reason why he's out. Um, you know, I think he, after Kilmarnock, went on a jolly down to London with Burnaby for a day or two, um, which, you know, they're entitled to do that. It is their day off, but, you know, we're in a title race and we've just dropped points. So, you know, maybe there's a mentality thing there as well. But, I mean, there's a lot of things we just never find out. I mean, look at what happened to Miss Onda. That was a... I mean, maybe I'm just out of the loop, but it seems like a bit of a mystery still what happened there. Uh, certainly Lagerbilk is going that way as well, but um, I certainly... It, it seems to bomb people, and we, we don't really find out for weeks, if not months. And, uh, you know, he's, he's not been a, a massive miss, Palma. You know, Maeda obviously does his, does his thing in keeping defenders busy and scoring the odd goal and you know, Kuhn's coming onto a game now um, and we're in a good bit of form, so it's sort of a massive concern like it was at other parts of the season, but um, it is a, some of these ones, are they are shrouded in mystery and it'll be interesting to see what happens with both Palma and Lagerbielka come the summer. I, I yeah. think it's really interesting in as much as we really need someone on the left. We don't have anyone on the left. So if Maeda gets down injured in a game, we're just, we're asking guys to play across because we were told they could play there when they come in, but they've never played there. You know, so he's the only one that's been playing on the left. We, we don't have any options. So it's strange. We've got, that a, we... we've got a really exciting youth player at West Brom called Johnston. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's actually Stop doing really it. well. Stop it. We've been talking about this. We, we, we prospect for seven pre-seasons or that stuff. But John, that's, that's a fair point. By the way, I totally forgot about Bernabe. I think he falls into the same category because you think about certain things that have happened. Um, Haxabanovich, yeah, what what have you done in the preseason to win your place back in the Celtic team, son? Oh, yeah, a peroxide dyed my hair and got some grills on my teeth and got a sleeve. Seriously. Yeah. You know, that, that was the kind of attitude. Then we've seen him during the preseason look completely disinterested. He did. Simple as that. Look disinterested. And then starts uh, doing all his talking on social media. Nonsense. So he gets bombed. Bernabe, it was the, the equalising goal, uh, Kilmarnock, I think, one each where he didn't seem that bothered about the fact that he didn't challenge for the ball. Remember, it went to VAR. And he's just kind of like prancing about. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't get it, mate. No. And at other points this season, despite the assists and despite the goals, I've been critical of Palma for just doing the, the kind of Yang thing, where he just kind of motions to, to tackle, but doesn't really tackle. Remember Aberdeen goal, uh, Mjof, uh, Bojan Miofsky? And it, was, it came from a poor Bernabe pass and a terrible attempt at a tackle from Palma. And I think Rogers is looking at that, John, thinking, wait a minute, this is not the type of player we need here. It's not just about flair and finesse. We need a bit of dig. I know that sounds old-fashioned, but Yang was guilty of that weekend as well, John. No, but again, it's with these, that there's, there's multiple different things in this one area, isn't it? Because what you need is elite focus and discipline. So when managers can see, first of all, that you're not disciplined, and that you're not doing the things you need to do for your own health, you know, you're out on a lash or whatever it might be. That is first red flag. Uh, second red, red flag, you know, are you focused enough? Are, you know, is football the be-all and end-all in your life? Is Are you completely focused on this this team? You know, are you looking at all the, the, the you know, the pre-match analysis? Are you taking it in? You know, because you think of someone like Yang, did he not know that that boy was going to cut in? Because he's done it, he did it last week. Yeah. Never mind. So how could you not know that? Right? So, you know, so th there's the guys who are obviously uh, don't necessarily have the discipline, but sometimes they have the talent. And then there are the guys who uh, don't have the focus and the commitment. Um, and if they, they don't also have the talent, then they're not going to last too long. Um, because it's an unbelievable level of discipline you need to do this. Uh, people forget that. This this is incredibly hard. You need to be focused on your training day and day. It is an incredible grind. It is a real grind. You know, and for a lot of these guys, it stops being fun. You know, uh, for a lot of the season, is not fun. It's just a grind. That constant physical battering of your body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and just no matter how you feel, You've got to be in there uh, getting it done. And it's an incredible... To, to be a, an elite-level athlete, is a, you know, there's a reason it's called elite. There's only a small percentage of people that can ever do it and do it well. Um, and there's a, But there are an awful lot of people around about the edges who could do it if they were focused. But that, that, that 
that last one percent of commitment, one percent of determination. I mean, you look at what Matt O'Reilly said about the offer that came in, um, and he said it turned his head, but not in the way that we thought. It turned his head in the, the way that you know it put. He felt uh, you know much more pressure on him mm -hmm. because I think you know you would have felt like you were trying to achieve something. Now someone's told you, no, this is real. You know, you're on the cusp of maybe achieving this thing. Um, so you go from your play was quite relaxed and you were, you know, you're trying to prove something. But now you're thinking, oh, no, this is a thing. Now I have to prove it. You know, this is real now. This is this is manifested because of what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, so anything can affect mentality like that. But, you know, the, the number of people, the, the Hans Abadoviches of the world and all the rest of it, just wasters, you know, because the majority of us would love, would love to have that level of talent. And I, I think people with that level of talent would be more inclined to get their heads down, knuckle down, uh, and not waste it. But unfortunately, uh, that is not the case with a lot of these guys. Um, but, I, you know, I don't necessarily blame them. Most people can't do this job. Um, so, you know, and it's no surprise we have a handful of them coming through every now and then. Yeah, and no doubt in about seven years we'll we'll hear Saeed Haksabanovich talking on a Stoke City podcast about Brendan Rodgers' belts and speaking Spanish in the dressing room. And because this is what happens, Patrick. It's like rather than be that 24-hour athlete, they all laugh about it years later. Oh, and we did this, and this was the funny, and this is what we've done when we were on tour. And you think to yourself, this is Celtic. You know, if you want to be that type of player, that's why you are where you are. You're not playing at the top level. Daniel, great to see you jumping in on the comments. Alistair Johnson is also at fault for the third goal. Let's not just pile on Yang. That's a fair point, absolutely. Stephen Donnelly, it has to be Kuhn. He is a far better defender than Yang. And there's people also saying about James Forrest, I think. Jerry Taylor spoke about James Forrest a few weeks ago, and he got loads of abuse for suggesting that Forrest would be a big player between now and the end of the season. Um, Stevie, Stevie Boy, Jamesy wouldn't have let Matondo get the shot away, that's for sure. The more I watch that goal, the worse it gets, Stevie. Um, particularly from behind Matondo, because by the time he strikes the ball, Paddy, Yang's not even in the shot. No. And all he has to do is get his body in front of him, between the player and scales, and he doesn't get the shot in. It's really frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think just about every other player would have blocked the shot. But, um, you know, in, a, in another scenario, in a more slightly... Is it positive... Is it positive to say the league might be decided on goal difference? I don't know if that is positive. Um, but you know, James Forrest, me and my dad joke about it all the time. He's so good at cut he's so good at coming on and scoring the third and fourth goal, mm -hmm. which might seem a bit futile at the time. Um but you know, when it's at the end of the season, I mean it's entirely possible not to bring back bad memories, but it's entirely possible we play the last game of the season away to Kilmarnock and the, the league is decided on goal difference. Um, which might bring back bad memories, but it's entirely possible. So Who's we need the first player you, know, you think of when you talk about that fixture, because I'm thinking Gordon Marshall here. Who's the first player you think of? Uh, I was only league? two, so oh. I, <laughs> he was only just to get two, that in there again. Oh my word! <laughs> Big, no, Marsh. I mean, Big Marsh. Big Marsh. He was I, the one I remember. I like to think it won't come to that again, because um, I, I, I do think we won. We will win all six of our games, so I like to think we'll win it on points. Um, but, you know, guys like James Forrest are important um, because he can come on decent defend, uh, defensively as a winger and he can score these goals and we can uh, hopefully rack up the goal difference as well as um, winning these games because ultimately I think a 2 nothing lead against Scottish teams is satisfactory. The weekend, I think, is a bit of an exception, but it shows that against teams like Rangers and even maybe even Hearts, you're never really home and hosed until the final whistle and you need to maintain a comfortable lead um, in these six games. And I know you mentioned my Dortmund top, it's not by accident. Uh, I'm just actually very bitter because it was 50 years ago today that the Atletico game at Parkhead, the, the nothing each draw, the shame game um, in the semi-final of the European Cup and they're playing Dortmund tonight, so... I'll be wearing my Dortmund top all day long <laughs> while watching the Champions League. I'm not, I'm not, um, good man. Not that's a, that's the kind of bitterness we like to see in our youth. That is, yeah, that's a healthy bitterness. <laughs> 50 years on, absolutely. I've, I've had the absolute pleasure to speak to a couple of the guys, uh, the late Pat McCluskey, uh, Davy Hay, who were involved in the game. 
and they've got this kind of rule, whatever happened in the tunnel, John stays in the tunnel because there was an almighty ruckus in that tunnel and I think a few police officers got involved as well. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know about the... Uh, I don't think that anything's kept secret like that anymore, is it? I think there's, there's probably... I mean, all those stories that Jackie told about uh, uh, like Gobo <laughs> clattering people down the tunnel. I mean, there, there's, there, there's, there, there's basically, there's, there seems to be footage of people everywhere now, so you don't get away with that anymore. But I, I did think that was one of the best stories I, I, I heard. It was absolutely brilliant. And his impersonation of Martin O'Neill's accent as well. It was off the ball or something he was on when he told the story about um, uh, Bobo uh, clattering the boy halfway down and then they get called into the captain's room. Um, and uh, who was it? Again? That's right. It was, uh, he said, uh, number, uh, he said Celtic captain friend, number 20, he's off. And he's like, who the heck is number 20? Because he thought it was going to be Bobo. It turned out it was um, by Grant Douglas. So yeah. Douglas was there. And then he's going, oh, you sent me Martin. Martin went, oh, no! It's just like, uh, uh, so it was just, it was a cracking story. I mean, those you love to hear that stuff, but it's, it, that's why the game's, be, you know, the game is becoming uh, less and less about that sort of thing now because there's, there's just too much coverage, you know. There's too many people looking at you all the time, um, you know, and there is just not the sense of humour about those things that there used to be. You know, big, big rocks down the down the tunnel are, are not as popular as they once were. Big grab took one for the team, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. Every so often, uh, the cameras would capture something, and the one I always remember is Terry Butcher kicking the door off its hinges as Billy McNeil was getting interviewed, I think, by Scott Sport at the time. And the look Big Billy gave him, because uh, Celtic had just beaten him one nothing in the cup. Tommy Coyne scored the goal at the back post. But uh, thanks, everybody, for getting involved. 1,400 strong on the chat today. It's been a brilliant uh, bulletin with Patrick and John. And as you can see across the ticker um, at the bottom of the page, I've not updated the, the figure, but there's about 30 tickets or so left for the aforementioned Martin O'Neill at Barra's Art and Design. He will be joining us on stage again. Um, it truly is a great night when O'Neill is in town. So come and join us. The ticket link is underneath the video. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Let us know in the comments section if you're watching this back uh, later on, your thoughts on everything that we've discussed. All that's left for me to say, Patrick McGill, John Hughes, thank you for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.